Memoirs of a Yellow Dog. I was born a yellow pup. Date, locality, pedigree, and weight unknown. The first thing I can recollect, an old woman had me in a basket at Broadway and 23rd, trying to sell me to a fat lady. Old Mother Hubbard was boosting me to beat the band as a genuine Pomeranian, Hamiltonian, Red Irish, Cochin, China, Stoke, Pogus, Fox Terrier. The fat lady chased a V around the samples of gross green flannelette in her shopping bag till she cornered it and gave up. From that moment I was a pet, a mama's own wootsy squidlums. Say, gentle reader, did you ever have a 200-pound woman breathing a flavor of camembert cheese and pull de España pick you up and wallop her nose all over you, remarking all the time in an Emma Eames tone of voice, snookledums. From a pedigreed yellow pup, I grew up to be an anonymous yellow cur, looking like a cross between an angora cat and a box of lemons. But my mistress never tumbled. She thought that the two primeval pups that Noah chased into the ark were but a collateral branch of my ancestors. It took two policemen to keep her from entering me at the Madison Square Garden for the Siberian Bloodhound Prize. I'll tell you about that flat. The house was the ordinary thing in New York, paved with Parian marble in the entrance hall and cobblestones above the first floor. Our flat was three, well, not flights, climbs up. My mistress rented it unfurnished and put in the regular things, 1903 antique upholstered parlor set, oil chromo of geishas and a Harlem tea house, rubber plant and husband. By serious, there was a biped I felt sorry for. He was a little man with sandy hair and whiskers, a good deal like mine. Enpecked? Oh, <laughs> well, toucans and flamingos and pelicans all had their bills in him. He wiped the dishes and listened to my mistress tell about the cheap, ragged things the lady with the squirrel-skin coat on the second floor hung out on her line to dry. And every evening, while she was getting supper, she made him take me out on the end of a string for a walk. If men knew how women pass the time when they're alone, they'd never marry. Laureline Jibby, peanut brittle, a little almond cream on the neck muscles, dishes unwashed, half an hour's talk with the ice man, reading a package of old letters, a couple of pickles and two bottles of malt extract, one hour peeking through a hole in the window shade into the flat across the air shaft, that's about all there is to it. Twenty minutes before time for him to come home from work, she straightens up the house, fixes a rat so it won't show, and gets out a lot of sewing for a ten-minute bluff. I led a dog's life in that flat. Most all day I lay there in my corner watching that fat woman kill time. I slept sometimes and had pipe dreams about being out chasing cats into basements and growling at old ladies with black mittens as a dog was intended to do. Then she'd pounce on me with a lot of that dribbling poodle palaver and kiss me on the nose. But what could I do? A dog can't chew cloves. I began to feel sorry for hubby, dog my cats if I didn't. We looked so much alike that people noticed it when we went out. So we shook the streets that Morgan's cab drives down and took to climbing the piles of last December's snow on the streets where cheap people live. One evening, when we were thus promenading, I was trying to look like a prize St. Bernard and the old man was trying to look like he wouldn't have murdered the first organ grinder he heard play Mendelssohn's Wedding March. I looked up at him and said in my way, What are you looking so sour about, you oakum-trimmed lobster? She don't kiss you. You don't have to sit on her lap and listen to talk that would make the book of a musical comedy sound like the maxims of Epictetus. You ought to be thankful you're not a dog. Brace up, Benedict, and bid the blues be gone. The matrimonial mishap looked down at me with almost canine intelligence in his face. Why, doggy, says he, good doggy, you almost look like you could speak. What is it, doggy? Cats? Cats could speak. But of course, he couldn't understand. Humans were denied the speech of animals. The only common ground of communication upon which dogs and men can get together is in fiction. In the flat across the hall from us lived a lady with a black and tan terrier. Her husband strung it and took it out every evening, but he always came home cheerful and whistling. One day I touched noses with the black and tan in the hall, and I struck him for an elucidation. See here, Wiggle and Skip, I says, you know that it ain't the nature of a real man to play dry nurse to a dog in public. I never saw one leash to a bow-wow yet that didn't look like he'd like to lick every other man that looked at him. But your boss comes in every day as perky and sit up as an amateur prestidigitator doing the egg trick. How does he do it? Don't tell me he likes it. Him, says the black and tan. Why? He uses nature's own remedy. He gets splificated. At first, when we go out, he's as shy as the man on the steamer who would rather play Pedro when they make them all jackpots. By the time we've been in eight saloons, he don't care whether the thing on the end of his line is a dog or a catfish. 
I've lost two inches of my tail trying to sidestep those swinging doors. The pointer I got from that terrier, vaudeville, please copy, set me to thinking. One evening, about six o'clock, my mistress ordered him to get busy and do the ozone act for lovey. I have concealed it until now, but that is what she called me. The black and tan was called tweetness. I consider that. I have the bulge on him as far as you could chase a rabbit. Still, lovey is something of a nomenclatural tin can on the tail of one's self-respect. At a quiet pace, on a safe street, I tightened the line of my custodian in front of an attractive, refined saloon. I made a dead-ahead scramble for the doors, whining like a dog in the press dispatches that let the family know that little Alice is bogged while gathering lilies in the brook. Why, darn my eyes, says the old man with a grin. Darn my eyes if the saffron-colored son of a seltzer lemonade ain't asking me in to take a drink. Let me see. How long's it been since I saved shoe leather by keeping one foot on the footrest? I believe I'll... <laughs> well, I knew I had him. Hot scotches he took, sitting at a table. For an hour he kept the Campbells coming. I sat by his side, rapping for the waiter with my tail, and eating free lunch such as Mama in her flat never equaled with her homemade truck bought at a delicatessen store eight minutes before Papa comes home. When the products of Scotland were all exhausted except the rye bread, the old man unwound me from the table leg and played me outside like a fisherman plays a salmon. Out there he took off my collar and threw it into the street. "'Poor doggy,' says he. "'Good doggy. She shan't kiss you any more. So darn shame. Good doggy. Go away and get run over by a streetcar and be happy.' Well, I refused to leave. I leaped and frisked around the old man's legs, happy as a pug on a rug. "'You old flea-headed woodchuck chaser,' I said to him, "'you moon baying rabbit pointing egg egg-stealing old beagle, "'can't you see that I don't want to leave you? "'Can't you see that we're both pups in the wood "'and the missus is the cruel uncle after you with the dish towel "'and me with the flea liniment and a pink bow to tie in my tail? "'Why not cut that all out and be pards forevermore?' "'Now maybe you'll say he didn't understand, maybe he didn't, "'but he kind of got a grip on the hot scotches "'and stood still for a minute thinking. "'Doggy,' says he finally, "'We don't live more than a dozen lives on this earth, "'and very few of us live to be more than three hundred. "'If I ever see that flat any more, I'm a flat, "'and if you do, you're flatter, and that's no flattery. "'I'm offering sixty to one that Westwood Ho wins out "'by the length of a dachshund.' "'There was no string, but I frolicked along with my master "'to the Twenty-Third Street Ferry, "'and the cats on the route saw a reason to give thanks "'that prehensile claws had been given them. "'On the Jersey side, my master said to a stranger "'who stood eating a currant bun, me and my doggie were bound for the Rocky Mountains. But what pleased me most was when my old man pulled both of my ears until I howled and said, You common monkey-headed rat-tailed sulfur-collared son of a doormat, do you know what I'm going to call you? I thought of Lovey, and I whined dolefully. I'm going to call you Pete, says my master, and if I had had five tails, I couldn't have done enough wagon to do justice to the occasion. The End of Memoirs of a Yellow Dog a short story by O. Henry.